Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And uh, welcome to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for joining us. Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. It's not something just done by scientists. It's not something that just lives in laboratories, but it's part of everyone, the fabric of everyone's lives. Every day we run into it. And uh, I have with me today uh, Mike uh, Nahoopi, if I've gotten that right, uh, who is a, uh, the executive director of the Kaha, Kaho, Olave uh, Reserve Island Reserve Commission. The Kaho Olave Island Reserve Commission. Commission. <laughs> you do much better than I. Uh, and KIRC. Uh, and it, uh, this is, I think, the, the project you're doing there is just a beautiful example of sort of likable science and why, how science really impacts people's lives, how projects really build off of science, how science actually feeds back into our lives, right? Yes, uh, we're, we're trying to integrate. Um, traditional knowledge from our ancestors, you know, Native Hawaiians here on Hawaii, but also integrating what we see as the modern technology, you know, taking the best of both worlds, combining them together, and then creating this hybrid of way of interacting with the soil, interacting with the land, managing an island and the ocean around it for, for the future generations. Yeah, no, and this is beautiful. It's a beautiful goal for the, for the sustainability and trying to, to build a uh, sort of a model, a model for the other Hawaiian islands to follow. Yeah. But so, I suspect a lot of people don't really know the history here of the island. I was reading a little bit, you know, some stuff you gave me about it. It's really, it's an island that's really been heavily abused, basically, right? Well, you know, it's it's one of the smallest islands here in the main island chain. And um, over 200 years ago, uh, one of the British uh, uh, discovered, or the, one of the British um, uh, captains came to Hawaii, brought this gift of goats. He brought it to Maui, placed them, and the they placed the goats on Kaholabe, and after 200 years of goats multiplying and eating all the native vegetation, you lose all the natural topsoil, you lose the natural vegetation and the plants, and you're exposed to these high winds and you lose the topsoil. So not only do we have this devastation of the environment, so ecological devastation on the island, but then in 1941, the military uh, comes to the island and utilizes it for over 50 years as a bombing range. So now you have, on top of goat, rat, uh, goat damage, you have bombs and unexploded ordnance and remnants from the military occupation of the island. Yeah, and so it's been really, uh, its whole surface has been changed radically, uh, I gather. I mean, there's huge gullies running down from its hills now that probably were not originally part of the landscape. There, there's no or very little surface vegetation cover on parts of it. Yes, uh, and so, you know, um, if, if we take a look at one of our slides we have here, we can see where Kaholabi is located. You know, we're just off the coast of Maui. Okay. We're only seven miles, but one of the difficulties that we have in this whole restoration effort we're doing is that seven miles is one of the roughest channels in Hawaii. Uh -huh. And um, our only means of going back and forth to Kaholabe is by boat. And uh -huh. we have our own landing craft that we take out there. Um, you know, after all those years of devastation with the goats, you have this hard pan, and we have another slide to show kind of an example of what the hard pan looks like. Uh, you have this, it's what you can imagine if you go out to a place and all the dirt is gone, up to 10 uh -huh. feet of soil is gone, and that is the dirt that's the rock that's underneath. And it's all red because we have a very high iron content and it kind of is rust. You're basically sitting on rust. So, you know, the island, um, one of our charts that we have here shows about 25% of the island is covered in this hard pan. So red, the red areas. The red areas. Map, um, yeah. And these are the areas that, as it rains, water doesn't penetrate through it. It just runs off the surface and it goes all, and it goes, carries this silt and mud to the ocean and starts covering the reef systems that we have around Kaholabe. Okay. So, um, and we have one, another slide to show you some of the unexploded ordnance that we've discovered. Uh, during the cleanup on the island, we've uh, we removed over a million unexploded ordnance items, and not only that, we picked up. Uh, they picked up every piece of scrap metal that's bigger than your thumbnail. Uh, it was over a million pounds of scrap metal found on the island, just from bomb fragments and pieces being blown up on the island. And yet, that work is by no means done, right? I mean, no, they're, they're... no. And we, and if you take a look at this next uh, slide we have here. You can see the red areas, right. which show that still 25% of the island has not been cleared. So, and only the blue and green areas here are the areas that they've cleared down to four feet. So we can actually dig in the soil and plant in those areas. Uh -huh. The rest of the islands, we can walk around, but 
we can't plant to those areas in the ground. Right, you so, don't want to be digging and ripping. Yeah, we might dig and hit a bomb yeah. on the ground. Right. So, you know, we had to come up with very creative means of how do you restore this devastated area that you can't dig. Yeah. And so we, we, we show you, we started off with this one picture here of, um, we had to use whatever we had. Right. So we went to a conference and they were giving away these lunches and we took all the lunch bags from everybody, they were throwing them away. We filled them with wood chips and seeds and laid them out on the hard pan area. And we found out that as the wind blows, it deposits soil in front of these bags hmm. that build clean soil. And eventually the bags break down and the bags have um, mulch and fertilizer and seeds. They grow into these clean soil hmm. and they, break, they finally penetrate into the ground. Mm -hmm. So we took those techniques and we said, you know what, let's expand that and let's see if we can use we have a lot of rocks. Mm -hmm. So what can we do at rocks? So um, we have another picture here of how we try to do the planting on the island with uh, large rock corridors mm -hmm. and adding soil on top of them and let the wind fill them with dirt mm -hmm. and then come back and plant them with native vegetation and hope, and they've been taking so. Oh, excellent, yeah. excellent. No, quite, quite the challenge though, because again, the, the, both the length of time and the extent of the devastation and the sort of the two kinds of devastation, the denuding by the goats and then the, the yeah. trashing with the, the ordinance, basically. Yeah, and because of the type of devastation that we see out there, we had to use a, um, a hybrid type of restoration. Um, the, a traditional way of planting, as you would for Native Hawaiian agriculture, would not be effective here, because this is not the type of environments that Native Hawaiians would have seen when they came to Hawaii. They, they would have seen more um, pristine areas, uh, thick soil, um, we have to use modern technology to overcome these difficulties that we introduce as our um, more modern uh, landscape and to try to replace that and help integrate this with cultural practices and also with modern science. Yeah, it's, you, you bring up a good point. It's, it's not, you can't take a traditional technique necessarily and apply it productively to a modern day problem, a problem caused by something that the traditional uh, Hawaiians would never have faced. They, they, they would never have seen that kind of level of devastation of a landscape, right? That, that's true. That would never have occurred. That's, that's other true. Than with a volcanic eruption or something. Yeah. And, well, in volcanic eruptions, they, they had um, techniques that you could see in the chants and stories of how the land restores itself mm -hmm. after uh, lava flows. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're actually seeing that now. Um, we've been studying in Hula um, the lava flows uh, in the Puna area and how the regrowth of those areas were documented. Uh, through the oral history and through the stories and legends relating to those areas. So we've seen the whole flow pattern was seen before and now we're kind of rediscovering them in the chants huh. that were done before. So it's kind of another interesting yeah. part of science and uh, Hawaiian cultural practices. That, that is, that's, that's so often we find that, that there's a wonderful sort of synergy between the two if you can pick up the traditional knowledge before it vanishes yeah. entirely. And you find they're very interesting parallels or complementary pieces of modern science now. Yeah, and that's and that's one of our goal of our organization. You know, we're, we we are a state agency, and most people think of you know we're uh, administratively attached to the Department of Land and Natural Resources, so they think of you know DLNR as this science organization and these land managers. But you know, we're more looking at a future way of managing land that is more culturally appropriate, it's also sustainable, and we also want to use the best of science integrated together. And you know, hopefully we, we can be on the test bed to try different techniques, and that's what we do a lot, is experiment with different techniques of planting, restoring, uh, managing the land. And when volunteers come to the island, they see our methods, and hopefully they take those lessons home, mm -hmm. and they apply it to their own areas, or they get interested in wanting to carry forth this knowledge that they're learning on Kaholawe to their own communities. Yeah, I mean, that, that was very interesting what you were, you were showing with the, the, using the bags filled with mulch, basically, as yeah. a, a initial sort of starter points to, to gather more windblown soil and all. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have to use what you have. Uh, uh, you know, what my restoration manager, he's very, he's very effective at using whatever materials we find. I think uh, one year we went around Maui and started gathering all the phone books that uh -huh. people were throwing away and we strung wires through the phone books, and we just let them flap through the wind, and as the pages flapped open, soil started collecting in them, and as we, we would walk by these rows of phone books, started throwing seeds in them, and eventually they break down, and they, they create you know, plants that are growing within these phone books, and the phone books has organic material, so you know, we're, we, one plant that we, if we even get one plant out of this whole project, that's one plant more than we had yesterday. Yeah. No, that, that's great. That's, that's, and it's, it's so, again, that sets this beautiful model because islands by their nature are 
relatively isolated and have to become self-sufficient. You have to think in terms of what do we have on hand that we can use to accomplish our, our needs. And it's just a whole island mindset, much more so than on a large landmass where you can really, you can say, oh, well, I'll just get it from over there because there's more of it over there. Yeah, and we, we had to think like that because we are so isolated. Right. You know, it, it does take a long way to get there. And on Kaholabi, we have very little infrastructure. So because of that, we're kind of forced to think, okay, what can I use that I have right here? I have a lot of kiabi, I have a lot of logs, I have a lot of wood chips. I have rocks, and you know we, we're trying to experiment. What can we do with rocks? Mm -hmm. How can we restore the island with just rocks? And mm -hmm. we're finding interesting things that are happening. Um, laying rocks into little depressions in the soil, they create shade. And as we throw seeds under them, that shade actually keeps the, the ground moist mm -hmm. just a little bit longer when it rains at night. And it's enough that um, it shades the ground when the sun comes up, uh, the seeds can germinate and it protects them from the wind mm -hmm. enough that they can establish themselves. Yeah, it so it gives them a chance to start taking root. Start taking root, yeah. yeah. Whereas then as the plants take root, they'll actually break down that hard pan because yeah. roots are amazingly yeah. uh, tough things in their own way, right? And yeah, and there's, it's, it's, you know, there's so much change on the island. Um, I, I first went to Kaholabi when I was 15 in high school, uh, back in the 80s, and, um, one of our projects was counting goats, and um, we counted 2,000 goats in just the one little valley that we were in. Um, they were finally able to eradicate all the goats in 93, and the landscape has changed dramatically. I remember hiking on areas that you don't see a single plant or a, a, a grass or anything for miles, and today um, a lot of the island is covered in grass. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it's alien species blowing over from Maui, but um, it's still holding the soil down. Now our work is trying to convert this landscape to a more traditional landscape for the purpose of reintroducing traditional cultural pract Hawaiian cultural practices. Right, and, and you got still a lot of challenge ahead of you because although we got rid of the goats and you got rid of the of most, well, at least some of the shells. Yeah. But you still have. You were saying the other day you've you still you got uh, alien mice basically that were not were not part of the native fauna at all, right? And and they actually because you've got probably a million of them or more. They yeah. actually end up eating a lot of your little seedlings that you put down, right? Yeah, that's one of the big problems we have is with this mice. They, um, they really, anytime something tries to grow up, um, they just get eaten by the mice. And also, we have a very serious cat problem. We have over 500, 600 cats right. that came from uh, the ranching eras about, uh, you know, over 100 years ago. And um, Kaholabi was known for seabirds. And the seabirds only live on the steep cliffs and the, the little offshoot islets. But our goal is eventually one day the seabirds can return to the main island and as we people live in close proximity to the seabirds, we hopefully will rediscover our ancestral knowledge or ancestral relationship with the seabirds and rediscover stories and maybe recreate some of the chants and, and olelo and, and hula or music relating to seabirds that we will rediscover by being in proximity, close proximity to seabirds. Yeah, and, and but of course, yeah, you've got these series of then intertwined, interlinked problems, right? Because you've got to get rid of the mice. Now, if you got rid of all the mice, presumably your feral cat population would crash too, yeah. right? Yeah. Since they presumably are a heavy food item for the cat. But you probably actually want to get rid of both simultaneously so yes. that the cats don't yes. prey on the remaining seabirds or anything. Yeah, and, th and that's the goal. And, yeah. you know, it's, 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 it's a large challenge, one, you know, and it's a challenge that requires a lot of funding. So that's the difficult part of it. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, but also a lot of very different kinds of technological expertise from what I'm just hearing you say. I mean, all, all this thing from, from thinking about land and, and soil, compaction, hard pan, erosion, to thinking about, yeah, how, how do we get rid of uh, invasive species, plants, animals, you know, how can we, and how can we do all this sort of in a sustainable way, right? And, and a, a hopefully at reasonably low cost without having to bring in a lot of extra stuff, right? Yeah. So, you, you know, we, not only are we out there uh, doing this restoration work, we have to live out there uh, while we're out there. You know, we can't just go back and forth, back and forth every day. Mm -hmm. So we actually manage a large base camp on the island so we can house volunteers to do this work. And, you know, in, back when the, this is actually the old military camp that they built around the 80s, and we've kind of inherited it after the cleanup. Uh, and, you know, we had to convert a lot of the mentality that was done during the military times. They had helicopters and large mm -hmm. boats to bring supplies in. So they had these huge generators and burning, you know, thousands of gallons of diesel fuel. And, you know, that turn, you turn that operation over to us, we have to rethink the way we live on the island, exactly. which causes, uh, you know, we have to re-engineer 
life on Kaholavi. Exactly, and that's, that's actually brings us to an interesting point, but I'm gonna take a little break right now because I'm being told we have to do so. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mike Naho OP is yeah. with us here, uh, here on uh, Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we'll be back in one minute. Hi, I'm Dave Stevens, the uh, host of Cyber Underground, uh, every Friday here at 1 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, and then every episode is uploaded to the Cyber Underground, that library of shows that you can see of mine on youtube.com. And uh, I hope you'll join us here every Friday. We have some topical discussions about why security matters and what could scare the absolute bejesus out of you if you just try to watch my show all the way through. Hope to see you next time on the Cyber Underground. Stay safe. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of the new Japanese language show on Think Tech Hawaii called Konnichiwa Hawaii. Broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. And welcome back here to the second half of uh, Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, I'm Ethan Allen, and with me today in the Think Tech Studios is Mike Nahu Pi. Excuse me, I blow that every time. Uh, he is head of the Kaholawe uh, Island Reserve Commission. Okay. And uh, and Mike, I, I realized I didn't didn't properly introduce you when you first came on. And not only are you executive director of, the, of that group, but you're a former U.S. Navy officer. You were a nuclear engineer, trained as a civil engineer. You did nuclear engineering on for the Navy, I gather, and. Uh, uh, graduate of Kamehameha Schools, yeah. uh, as well as the U.S. Naval Academy, and um, furthermore, very, a very talented uh, artist, craftsperson. You could say maybe a, a word or two about, about your weavings that are... Uh, yeah, you know, um, my time on Kaholavi introduced me to... I spent a lot of time with the protect Kaholavi Ohana, and, and you know, um, prior to that time, I was a military officer, so, you know, I was very much into what I was doing with engineering and the work with the, in the military. But then um, my job was on Kaholavi in the 90s, and I spent a lot of time with the uh, Protect Kaholavi Ohana, uh, a lot of Native Hawaiians, and I saw a lot of Native Hawaiians doing crafts and hula, and I started to get uh, reinterested in these things. I had seen them when I was a child, and I remember them when I was a child, but uh, it encouraged me to explore it further, so I got involved in uh, hula and dance and chanting, and then also uh, lahala weaving, so I weave hats. I teach uh, weaving classes and woodworking and then making implements. So yeah, I, I, I was able to uh, uh, have some of my stuff exhibited at Bishop Museum and also at the Smithsonian and, and folk, spent time at the Folk Life Festival with other Native American weavers. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, very, very rich background. And yeah, I, I think what you're doing here is a beautiful example of sort of the richness of both engineering as a field, because you're using very multiple aspects of engineering, but also how it ties in to uh, a lot of traditional Hawaiian Sort of worldviews and 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 the, the, this beautiful complementary aspects there. Yeah, it works really well. Um, you know, some of my uh, kumus or teachers before said, you know, engineers make one of the best artisans for for a lot of traditional crafts because there is a lot of repetitive pattern seeking and mm -hmm. and analyzing of patterns. And uh, engineers have uh, good visualization capabilities of analyzing patterns and and expounding and uh, projecting those patterns forward into newer takes of. Of way of reproducing those forms. Excellent, excellent. And speaking of patterns, and all, right before the break, we were talking about you, you're sort of based out of the, the old military base camp there on, on the island, yeah. and you had to really sort of rethink that and, and readjust it because it was all dependent very much on bringing in lots of diesel fuel and lots of supplies from the outside, and you were trying to build a more self sustaining uh, way of life here, right? Well, you, you, true, and you know, one of the things, the challenges that we have on Kaholavi is one, it's distance, mm -hmm. and it's the lack of infrastructure, but the mm -hmm. real biggest challenge is water. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, that's something that you see across all of the places in Hawaii, uh, especially on Kaholavi. Uh, our camp, we get about anywhere from 11 to 18 inches a year. Uh, maybe the top of the island, we're a little bit maybe in the low 20s, the high 20s. Uh, we're, we're pretty much a desert island, and we're trying to replant a desert island with almost no water. Mm -hmm. So what we had to do was find ways of collecting, creating, gathering water, 
so that we can use it for living, but also use it for the restoration effort. So this one photograph we have here shows this two half acre panels that we use to collect rainwater. Wow. And then we funnel that water down into the two storage tanks. They're about 180,000 gallons of storage. And we have a capacity with what would a third tank. We have about a, half a million gallons of storage uh, yeah. located on the top of the island that we use for irrigating our plants. And uh, we have a photograph here of what this, and a computer simulation of all the irrigation lines, 28 wow. miles or 26 wow. to 28 miles of irrigation that we have laid on the island so that we can start plant uh, cultivations on the island. Excellent. And we found that uh, just by watering these new seedlings for about three or four months, it increases the survivability from 10 to 15 percent to about 80 mm percent. -hmm. And it really increased the effectiveness of our work. Uh, the other part is we have to have water to drink. Uh, mm -hmm. For a long time in the military, they used to bring water in by boat. Um, we actually create water from ocean water. We have, we've been doing uh, desalinization uh, through reverse osmosis for over 20 years on Kaholabe. Wow. And it, it, but it's a very power hungry system. Right. Uh, it takes a lot of electricity and you know, probably for a gallon of water out there, probably the most expensive water that you could find in Hawaii. Because right. not only do we need diesel fuel, we transport that diesel fuel on our own boats, mm -hmm. store it, run it through our generators, create electricity, run electricity to our desalinization plant. Mm -hmm. So because of those high costs and that high effort of doing that work, we have to become more sustainable. How can we do this cheaper, more efficiently? And that was a project that we got a lot of support from the legislature. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of our uh, representatives and senators supported that we find sustainability on Kahoa Lobby. Instead of keep asking for money, how can they invest you know, through mm -hmm. infrastructure that we can become more sustainable? So mm -hmm. while this photo's here, we have a short video of our photovoltaic system. And it, this project was not only to build uh, over 100 kilowatts of photovoltaic panels on the island, but was to re-engineer our camp operations to reduce the energy requirements for Kahoa Lobby wow. and install, uh, install uh, over 80 kilowatts of uh, battery. Mm -hmm. So right now, we've gone from maybe 1,000 gallons a month of diesel fuel that we'd be burning for the two weeks that were open. Uh, I think last month, uh, I just got reports that we're down to under 20 gallons. Wow. And we're getting even better as we learn how to re live or, or how to change the way we live on Kahoa Lab to be more energy efficient on the Excellent. island. Excellent. That's, again, you're setting a beautiful model because, of course, the state as a whole has a yeah. uh, goal of energy self-sufficiency by 2045, and so you guys are well on your way to, to, well, to we're, beating that, right? Yeah, be, being a state agency, we're, we're following the directive of, of the governor and his uh, policy of becoming uh, you know, uh, self-sustaining on mm -hmm. power. Uh, so we could now tell the governor that you could check Kahoa Lobby off and we are 100% self-sustaining now with um, the power we have on the island. Uh, we're now trying to become uh, fossil fuel free. So mm -hmm. we're now partnering with a couple other organizations and we're still using gasoline on some of the vehicles just mm -hmm. because uh, we're looking at electric vehicles, but right now they don't build electric trucks or off-road vehicles with enough torque. But as they come, we're also looking at portable charging stations that we can tow with us to the work areas. and. We can charge them to the day while we're working, and they'll be all powered up for us to go home at night, and then we plug it into our system. But we're also looking at how do we get rid of propane, because mm -hmm. our kitchen is running on propane. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the things that we're hoping to uh, invest with and partner with people about is using that excess electrical power we have now from mm -hmm. the sun to create hydrogen uh -huh. and break, um, break water down into hydrogen and run the hydrogen through our kitchen ah. and our um, uh, water heater that we have. We have, a, we have a propane water heater for the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Everything else is solar. But um, how can we use hydrogen for our kitchen mm -hmm. and then eliminate all fossil fuels from Kahoa Lave? So yeah. that's our next goal for us. Fa fascinating. Yeah. And, uh, great, great stuff. The, uh, I, I was thinking when you were talking about the water issues, yeah. Uh, not only is there reverse osmosis, but of course there's passive solar distillation and there, there are new uh, new designs of stills that are much more efficient, three or four times more efficient than, than the classic uh, old solar stills. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we, we'll be yeah. able to investigate the new technologies that are available. Um, not only uh, the passive solar stills, but um, we've been talking to people about um, gathering um, water from the air. 
They're yeah. talking about humidity and um, distilling water from uh, the humidity that's out of the island. Yeah. Uh, we, we have some issues because um, we're very dry desert right. island, but you know, we're, we're open to looking at all different types of technologies. Yeah, there are fog fences and these kind of things. There's also some brand new technologies now. Again, some of the, the uh, material scientists are developing what they call slippery rough surfaces that are textured just right to tend to pull water molecules out of the air and condense them and have them run down together and actually form droplets. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're actually using that, that, that theory, that the ideas of um, the moisture from the air in a very uh, low-tech methodology. Um, one of our planting areas, we are looking at the depressions that we find in the natural hard pan and putting rocks down, where we have a lot of rocks. Mm -hmm. And just from the shade uh, that the rocks produce over the soil under them, the nighttime dew that penetrates through the soil actually has now, is able to stay in that soil a little bit longer, mm -hmm. which allows seedlings and little um, the seeds to germinate and to grow. So it's the same technology, same idea and the same theories, but using an old school, low tech mm -hmm. approach. Now, it's, it's amazing to hear you talk all the, this, this huge array of techniques spanning that whole spectrum from very old fashioned, very low tech to very current modern high tech. Yeah. And it's great that you're able to synthesize that. And I really think it's, again, it's a, it's a perfect model here for Hawaii. Hawaii has to have that whole spectrum of approaches and techniques if we're, if we're really gonna thrive in the next century, right? I mean. Well, the, the science is always the same. The science is the same, it's the materials that are different and it's the construction techniques, you know. Um, right. Example is my own house. Um, they built our, my house so that the corner of the house has all the windows and it allows uh, airflow uh, mm -hmm. through the house. Um, those same techniques, uh, we kind of went away when we went to more of the mainland building structures, mm -hmm. uh, getting airtight buildings. But in Hawaii, we don't need that airtight building construction. Right. So maybe some of those uh, theories of elevated houses, so wind flow cools the subflooring, right. and those things can come back. They're very same, uh, the same science, but just going back to some of the old techniques using new materials. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great stuff, it's great yeah. stuff. This, this yeah. is, I mean, this is a really wonderful example of you know, restoring a sacred island and at the same time really setting, setting a, a vision for the rest of the state and an inspiration for the rest of the state about, about here are ways you can, you can tackle these complex problems. So this is, it's great to, to have you here, great to hear all this wonderful stuff and I know you, uh, you wanted to say, you know, you've got maybe 10 seconds to say. Yeah, so I just want to show this last slide is what we're hoping for in the future, we want to build our uh, education and operations center in Kihei. We have this eight acre property where we currently run the boat back and forth to Kaholawe. But we want to create, we want to connect this tie between Maui and Kaholawe so that we can bring people to Kaholawe and also uh, quantify these, these th lessons we've learned and to share them with other people. Yeah. People can come and visit our center. They can learn some of these techniques. We'll have a museum, but we also want to honor the people that struggled to get Kaolabi back to us. The, the early protect Kaolabi Ohana people that, that fought the military, that stood up to, to um, get the people of Hawaii engaged so that they can get Kaolabi back. We wanna make sure that this next generation that we have coming and visiting us and working with us know these stories from the past so that they can always honor the work of our past generations have done to provide for them today. Absolutely, per perfect uh, wrap up here. We are out of time. Mike, I've so much enjoyed having you here. I've learned a tremendous amount from hearing, hearing you, you talk. And I hope uh, you'll come back and join us on Likeable Science on our next episode. Until then.